Good evening, and welcome to the last of our five Faith in Life uh, lecture events for the 2016-2017 season. We're delighted that you're here. Uh, I have found myself saying this more than once in the last 14 years of the, se se of the series, namely, it's a beautiful day out, um, so you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> It, that has happened more than a few times, actually. I, I do like to open, uh, well, I'm, and I'm, I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, by the way, the senior pastor at St. Philip Deacon. Uh, on behalf of St. Philip Deacon and Mount Olivet Lutheran of Plymouth, which co-present these events, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here tonight. The first question I'd like to ask is, how many of you have never been to a Faith in Life event before? So, okay, maybe a third or half of you. So, particular and special welcome to all of you. Um, the format tonight, I'm going to get out of here in a moment so you can hear the speaker. Um, she'll speak for 45 or 50 minutes. I'll have a couple of uh, thank yous to say, and then we'll have 10 or 15 minutes of open mic Q&A. So be thinking about questions you might want to ask. There are mics to my right and to my left. Uh, following that, she'll stick around for a while to answer questions and sign books. We have some books available of hers for sale in the narthex from Subtext Books, uh, which is an independent bookseller in St. Paul. And thank you to Matt, as always, for helping out with these events. Um, you can read about our speaker's uh, official bio, or at least part of her bio in the program tonight. I always like to ask the speakers when I pick them up if, the, if there's something sort of off the beaten path that I can uh, say about them uh, while I'm introducing them. And I asked our speaker that question today, and she said, not really, I'm the most uninteresting person in the world. Um, <laughs> Although I will tell you one thing, she's an Episcopalian, and uh, as we were walking into the sanctuary tonight, we were talking about St. Philip the Deacon, and her question to me, a Lutheran, was, when is his feast day? And like a good Lutheran, I suppose, I said, I don't really know. <laughs> so she looked it up, and it, you will maybe not believe his feast day is actually yesterday, May 3rd. So um, maybe we'll do something about that later, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Anyway, she is a talented uh, speaker and teacher and author. We are delighted that she's able to be with us tonight. Will you help me welcome Lauren Winner? Thanks. Oh, I'm going to take this. Thank you. Um, it really is a gorgeous day out there, so I said to Tim, I'm not sure I would have come to a lecture on an evening like this. So thank you very much for giving up some outdoor, beautiful outdoor time um, to be here tonight. And thank you, Tim, for inviting me and bringing me here. Um, I'm a big fan of the Twin Cities. I've never spent a winter in the Twin Cities, but I did about 20 years ago live here for a summer. And um, I always love an opportunity to come back so I'm going to talk tonight um, about some material I started working on about five or six years ago. And it's material about what the metaphors and similes and baskets of figurative language are used by the biblical writers to talk about God. But before I get into that material, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I think that whenever we come to an intellectual project or a spiritual project, and for me, this question of how the Bible uses metaphorical language to talk about God is very much both an intellectual and a spiritual project. Um, I think whenever we come to an intellectual or spiritual project, there's something of our own autobiography and our own life journey and faith journey in that. So I just want to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about my own faith journey and how I got to be interested in this topic of metaphorical language the Bible uses for God. Um, so I, uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm an Episcopalian. I'm an Episcopal priest. I didn't grow up in the Episcopal Church. I grew up Jewish. Um, and I was an intensely um, nerdy teenager, uh, and I was intensely nerdy about my involvement with my Jewish community growing up. Um, today, I look at the youth group, the kids uh, in my church, 
back in North Carolina, and I say that they're kind of church nerds, so I was sort of a synagogue nerd. Um, I was just at the synagogue. Uh, whenever it was open, basically, I taught Hebrew school. Um, I was part of a Jewish meditation group. The synagogue allowed me to sometimes lead worship at Shabbat services, and they allowed me to preach. I preached my first sermon when I was 14 on the biblical account of the rape of Dina. <laughs> Fortunately, the manuscript of this sermon has been lost to the mists of time. I shudder to think what I thought I had to say about that at age 14. Um, so I was just deeply involved in the life of the Jewish community where I lived. I uh, spent my middle school and high school years in Charlottesville, Virginia, and was very involved in the Jewish community there. And I went off to college when I was 16. I went to college in New York City, and I selected the college that I was going to attend, Columbia University, in large part because there was a pretty large Jewish student group there, a pretty involved Jewish student community. And I went off to college, and the women at my synagogue sort of made up this farewell ritual for me as I went off to school. They gave me Shabbat candlesticks and a Kiddush cup, and they prayed over me. And I think everyone thought I was going to eventually come back a rabbi. Like, that seemed to sort of be the logical trajectory. No one imagined that I was going to come back an Episcopalian. <laughs> that was not in the cards. Um, so I don't have one of those dateable conversion stories, and it may be, it probably is the case that some people here have that way of narrating your faith life, where you can say that you became a Christian at 10.03 in the morning on January 2nd, 1992 or something. Um, that's a venerable way of narrating our faith lives in the Christian tradition. St. Paul had a dateable conversion story on the road to Damascus. Um, Wesley had a dateable moment at which his heart was strangely warmed. So, venerable way of narrating uh, the Christian faith life. I don't have a dateable conversion like that. Um, I just have this story that doesn't have much narrative shape, um, that as I was in college, things happened that sort of turned my attention to Jesus and turned my attention to the church. So I'll tell you one or two of those things, then I'll get into the um, heart of our material tonight. So one of the things that happened to me in college that turned my attention to Jesus, and it has taken me many years to be able to tell this story with a straight face, uh, but I will try. I was a sophomore in college, and I had a dream in which my friend Michelle and I and some other women were kidnapped by a group of mermaids. <laughs> See? Um, we were taken underwater. We didn't, like, grow fins or sprout gills or tails or anything, but somehow we could just totally function just fine underwater. So we were taken underwater to Mer Society, uh, which it turns out is quite advanced, very sophisticated society. And... Um, the mermaids were actually pretty nice captors. They did not keep us locked up in a dark room or shackled. Um, we were able to do, we were allowed to do whatever we wanted down there in, in Mer society. We just couldn't come home. And so after about a year of being captive to the mermaids, um, a group of men came on a rescue mission. As an aside, I have always been deeply troubled by the gender dynamics of this dream, <laughs> in which all of the victims were women and all of the rescuers were men, but we can talk about that at the reception later if people want to. Um, so, so this group of men came on a rescue mission, and most of them, frankly, were kind of balding, paunchy, like NFL-watching types of men. Um, but one of them looked exactly like Daniel J. Lewis. Now, this dream was a good 20 years ago, so do not picture the Daniel J. Lewis of the Lincoln biopic, right? Picture the young, gorgeous, my beautiful laundrette Daniel J. Lewis. 
And I knew that he had come to rescue me, specifically. And um, we were rescued, we went back to Earth, and then I woke up. Now, I actually have kind of quirky dreams pretty much every night. I usually remember them. It's not even all that rare for them to feature like magical creatures, such as mermaids or unicorns or what have you. But this dream was unusual for me because I woke up totally certain that the dream had come from God and that the dream was not really about Daniel Day-Lewis. The dream was actually about Jesus. That the person rescuing me, saving me, if you will, was Jesus. Now, I don't know how much you know about Judaism, but you probably know enough to know that there's not a whole lot of room in an observant Jewish life for thinking that God is sending you dreams about Jesus Christ saving you, right? That, that takes you out of the fold of normative Judaism. So I didn't really want to have had this dream. It made me uncomfortable. I thought about it for a while. I talked to a couple of people about it. And then I sort of shelved it. I shelved it for a couple of years. I'll tell you one more experience I had in college that sort of got my attention to Jesus. Um, has anyone here read the Mitford novels? I see some hands. Okay. So the Mitford novels were these novels that were published in the 1990s. Um, they're sort of saccharine, middle-brow Christian novels. They don't really have plots. There are nine of them. There was eventually a series of nine of them. They follow, the main character is an Episcopal priest named Father Tim, appropriately. <laughs> and he is the perfect priest. He's, he even has the perfect basket of foibles, like the exact right flaws that you want in a priest. Um, and the novels just basically follow Father Tim as he ministers to his band of parishioners and neighbors. He actually falls in love with his next door neighbor who's a children's writer with great legs and they get married and they take in a bunch of foster kids. Oh, and he has this dog named Barnabas who is not controlled by the normal canine commands but is controlled by the recitation of scripture verses. <laughs> the point, I think, is that we all should be like Barnabas, right? We should all just be controlled by the recitation of scripture. So these are not works of great literary merit. Um, but I stumbled over the first two of the Mitford novels uh, shortly before my senior year in college, and I kind of became obsessed with them. I read them like six times in a week and a half. And I knew they were fiction, and I knew they were not great literature, and I would much rather be standing here and telling you that I was converted by reading Dostoevsky because I'm an intellectual snob, but... I read these novels and I just was hooked by this depiction of, of characters, people in the novels, whose lives seemed to be infused entirely by faith. There really seemed to be no aspect of these characters' lives that wasn't somehow integrated into a life of faith and somehow caught up with life with God and life before God. And I was just captivated by that, taken by that. So uh, this, there's no dramatic moment now in this story. Things like this kept happening to me. I moved to England to go to graduate school. I started going to church. I was baptized. If you pressed me to tell you the day on which I became a Christian, I would say it was the day on which I was baptized. I was 21 years old. And I was the most enthusiastic convert to Christianity that you could ever hope to not meet. <laughs> I was just totally geeked out for things to do with Christianity. I obsessively read about Christianity. I like immediately wanted to become a priest, the whole shebang. And, and for many years, I had this very palpable sense that God was just right next to me, that Jesus was sort of walking alongside me 
wherever I went. And I had this, I mean, I felt kind of like I'd become a Mitford novel person. I really did have this sense that, that faith was really saturating, soaking in, saturating everything in my life. And that, you know, Awesome. Okay. Where was I? My spiritual life was just about to take a nosedive, I think. Um, so in a not very dramatic way, this, this sense of Jesus just being right to hand just sort of gradually faded, right? This does happen in the spiritual life. You get yourself to one place in the spiritual life and you mistakenly think it's just going to be like that for the whole rest of your life. And of course that's basically never true in the Christian spiritual life. One of the few things that we know is a certainty in the Christian spiritual life is that it rarely stays the same forever and ever. So I, I came into this moment in my spiritual life where I increasingly felt far away from God, in some ways pretty estranged from God, but I just really lost this sense of God's nearness and it was really out of that that my interest in how the biblical authors gave language to what they knew about God, how did they put words to who they knew God to be, and how did they put words to who they knew themselves to be, in the company of God. It was really in that space of actually feeling quite far away from God that my interest in that question was piqued. Because I, I began to realize that, um, that I had pretty limited images of who God was, finally, and that my images of God were sort of old, and not, not old in the sense of um, the champagne flutes that were your grandmother's, and they take on actually a whole lot of meaning because they're old and when you use them, you know, you can recall your grandmother using them at family birthday parties and you can recall your sister toasting her beloved at her wedding. Not old in that sense. Rather, my images of God were kind of like a health sciences textbook from 1964. Um, you know, which is like a really interesting resource if you want to know about health sciences pedagogy in the 1960s but actually kind of dated and just won't really go the distance um, for health in 2017. So I realized that when, it, when push came to shove, I basically thought of God in two ways. I thought of God as my boyfriend, and I thought of God as kind of a wise college professor. Now, those are not terrible metaphors for God. In fact, they're actually pretty biblical, right? The Bible actually has all this language of erotic love between the church and Jesus, the Song of Songs, like Jesus is described as marrying the church, and etc. So the boyfriend imagery, somewhat biblical. Jesus also is our teacher, right? So thinking of Jesus as a wise college professor. These are not the worst ways of thinking about God. They're just somewhat limited, finally. And I began to think they probably are not going to go the distance of carrying me in my spiritual life for 
you know, the next however many years or decades I get on this planet. So I began to wonder what else the scriptures had to say about this. And as I looked into the scriptures with this pretty focused question, what kinds of metaphorical language, what kinds of similes, what kinds of figurative languages are applied in the Bible to the task of trying to talk about God, I noticed a couple of things. First of all, I noticed that there are like nine million and three different metaphors for God in the Bible. But in our individual spiritual lives and in our church lives, we don't use most of them, right? So if you just think for a moment in your own prayer life, your church life, think about the prayers you say, the hymns you sing, what are the metaphors you use for God? What are the names you use for God? And I think most of us have like three or four or five that are our primary bits of language for God. So in my church community, we use a lot of father language. That's one of our primary ways of talking to and about God, father. We use a lot of um, good shepherd language. That's pretty important in my church community. Um, we use a lot of Jesus as the great physician. There are a lot of people in my community who really need God to be the great physician, and that's some language we use. We use a lot of Jesus as our friend, you know, coming from the end of the Gospel of John, where Jesus says that we are indeed Jesus' friends. We use that language a lot. That's about it. There's a whole lot of biblical language for God that in my community we don't really use, and I think that that's true of all of us. So the church kind of picks up certain of these bits of language for God and runs with them. So there are a great many churches in this nation named after Jesus the Good Shepherd, right? Church of the Good Shepherd, Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd, Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd. There are a lot of those. There are far fewer churches of the mother hen. But Jesus does actually identify himself as a mother hen in two of the Gospels. But yet somehow, it was his identification with himself as the good shepherd that we like turned into stained glass windows and church names. And I don't think, I, I mean, these are abstract representations, but I'm not noticing a mother hen representation of Jesus in these stained glass windows. So, so there are all these bits of language for God in the scriptures that we just don't pay very much attention to. One thing that's interesting about these bits of language is that other Christian communities in other time periods did actually pay more attention to some of the images that we overlook. And I'm going to come to one of those images in a minute. Um, but as I was beginning this study, and I've been pursuing this study now for about six years of metaphors and imagery in the Bible for God, I noticed that my own attention was really drawn to those images for God in the Bible that had something to do with my everyday life. And there are some images for God in the Bible that do not directly connect to, at least to my everyday life. So, for example, the language of king. Now, king is very important biblical language for God in the Jewish community that I grew up in. It's extremely important language for God. And it's good language. It focuses our attention on the aspects of God that are about being transcendent you know, and really different from us. It's good language for God, but it doesn't like immediately resonate with me because I don't know any kings. I don't live in a country, thankfully, governed by a king. I'm really grateful the Bible doesn't actually talk about like, I don't know, speaker of the house as a metaphor for God or something. <laughs> but probably if it did, I would have more 
connection with that image, good and ill connection, right? So I don't really know, or even, you know, shepherd, taking, going back to the shepherd language, which is important language, the 23rd Psalm, Jesus the good shepherd, but I don't know any shepherds. So I don't really connect to that language. Well, I say that, but it's not actually true. I do know one shepherd. I will digress for a moment, if you will indulge me that, to just tell you a little bit about the shepherd, the one shepherd I know. Um, about four years ago, four and a half years ago, I had just um, accepted my first call to serve as a pastor of a church. And this is the church where I still serve, a very small Episcopal church in Lewisburg, North Carolina. I had just accepted the call to serve as their pastor, and I was very nervous about having done this. I had not served as the pastor of a church before. Pastoral is not the first word that comes to people's lips when they think of me. And I wondered if I could do it. I, I really wasn't sure that I was going to be able to do, to do the job. So about a week after I accepted this job, I flew from North Carolina to Seattle to give some lectures at a church in downtown Seattle, and a woman from the church picked me up at the airport, and as she was driving me into town, she was telling me about the church, and she said, at our church, we have three pastors. I'm going to tell you about them. Pastor X focuses on um, like our social justice mission outreach work. Pastor Z focuses on our children's and adult education, and the other pastor is a shepherd. And I said, you know, I have just taken this job at a church, and I'm just hearing you say that this third pastor is a shepherd, and I'm realizing that if five years from now, if, if someone from my church is saying that about me, Lauren as a pastor, then I will know that I have, I have actually figured out how to, how to be their priest, how to do the job. And the woman said, no, she really is a pastor, a, sh a shepherd. And I said, well, exactly. I mean, if they're saying about me, she really is a shepherd, then I will know that I have really learned to be their priest. And the woman said, she lives on a sheep farm. <laughs> And I'm not making this up. Pastor Catherine lives on a sheep farm on an island off the coast of Seattle, gets up every morning, tends to her sheep, and then hops on her motorcycle and motorcycles to the ferry and ferries into her church job, where I'm sure she's also a shepherd of a sort. Um, so I now do know Pastor Catherine a little bit. And now when we read, as we actually will this coming Sunday in my church, when we read the 23rd Psalm and the Good Shepherd passage, Jesus is the Good Shepherd, I picture Pastor Catherine on her motorcycle, having been tending her sheep all morning. Um, so other than Pastor Catherine, I don't really know any shepherds, and therefore the shepherd image doesn't immediately get my attention when I'm reading the scriptures. But the images that do immediately get my attention are those images that identify God with some object or some creature that's pretty deeply connected to my life. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk in some detail about one of those images. And it's the image of God as clothing. Now, I think it's safe to say that this is not a biblical image or a metaphor that we have made front and center in our Christian spiritual lives um, in the 21st century. But in fact, in earlier eras in the church, it actually was a pretty important image. And people did a lot of praying around this image, preaching with this image. So let's just go into the image a little bit. If you start looking for clothing in the Bible, you find it pretty early on. The first focused discussion of clothing in the scriptures comes in the third chapter of Genesis, so pretty early. Right, so where, where are we in the third chapter of Genesis? What's happening? So Adam and Eve have been created. The whole tree situation has happened. Eve has eaten the fruit of the tree. Um, 
God has, she's given the fruit to Adam, God has found out about this, and Adam and Eve are going to have to leave the garden. They are just about to be exiled from the garden when Genesis tells us God made for them garments of skin. God made for them garments of skin. Now, I've known this Bible story since I was a little girl, the Adam and Eve story. I knew about the garments of skin. Until pretty recently, I thought that the verse meant that God at that moment gave Adam and Eve like their, skin, their actual skin. I just thought that's what the verse meant. If you'd asked me what I thought they looked like before this happened, um, I'm not sure what I would have said. I, I was recently at a doctor's appointment, and they had one of those, um, those transparencies that they sometimes have in doctor's offices with the cutaways of the human body, where you see like the skeletal system, the muscle system. I think I would have thought they looked like that. So I just thought this is when God gave Adam and Eve their skin. It turns out this is not the dominant interpretation of the verse. <laughs> the primary interpretation of the verse for most Christian readers, for most of church history, is that God made Adam and Eve clothes of animal skin. That God made them leather suits and rabbit fur jackets. And then sent them out into the world, right? So this is such an interesting picture because I think so often we come to the Adam and Eve story and whether you think it's a literal story or a myth, whatever you think about the story, we assume that God is really angry at this moment in the story. But the text doesn't actually tell us that God is angry. The text tells us that God made Adam and Eve some warm and beautiful, hearty clothing before sending them out into the world. And I think it's a picture of such generosity on God's part and possibly some sadness. You know, you can sort of picture God feeling or thinking or saying, you really do have to leave now, but I want to do this one thing for you before you go, make you these clothes. So what I want you to notice is that very early on in the Bible, we're getting a picture of God as a tailor or God as a seamstress. One of our earliest pictures of God from the Bible is God as a tailor or a seamstress. And when you then start looking for clothing, once you notice this moment in Genesis 3, you start looking for clothing throughout the Bible, you just find it all over the place. There is clothing language and clothing imagery just all over the scriptures. But I want to take us for a moment to what to my eye is one of the other most interesting locations of clothing. And this is in Galatians 3. So pretty much almost at the other end of the Bible. And in Galatians 3, Paul tells us that those of us who have been baptized have been clothed in Christ. So if you were wondering where exactly does it tell us that God is a cardigan sweater or something, I will now admit there is no actual verse of the Bible that actually says God is a cardigan sweater. But both in Galatians and in Romans, Paul tells us that we, the baptized, have been clothed in Jesus. So it doesn't seem to me like a very big stretch to say, if we are clothed in Jesus, that's an invitation to think of Jesus as our clothing. So I want to just take us for a moment into thinking about what that image might mean. And honestly, we could stay here all weekend and think about this. We have such associations with clothing that whatever clothing might mean in my life, it's going to mean seven other things in your life. But let me just throw out a few ideas about how clothing works in our lives. And if this is how clothing works, then what does it mean to say Jesus is that? Jesus is clothing. So for starters, we might think about the word fashion. Fashion is a noun, fancy, expensive French clothing that, you know, 
most of us wouldn't be caught dead and even if we could afford it, right? But fashion is also a verb, and it was actually a verb first, and it's a verb that means to shape or to mold, so that you might fashion clay into the shape of a vase or the shape of candlesticks, right? You might fashion clay into a particular shape. And that's the very reason that the word fashion became a noun meaning clothing, because people recognize that clothing shapes us into particular directions, particular personas. So if I were to whisk you into my bedroom in Durham, North Carolina and show you my closet, you would see that I have three very distinct kinds of clothing in my closet, and they all sort of shape me somewhat differently. So I have some suits from Talbot's, that I bought when I was first starting out as a professor, kind of Jackie O. Talbot suits. And when I wear those outfits, which I don't do very often, but when I do, they, they really make me carry myself a little differently. Like I carry myself in a somewhat more calm and adult way, and my posture is actually improving just thinking about these clothes, these suits. Um, apparently, I also carry myself with better posture when I wear them. Um, I have those clothes. Then I have some vintage clothing. I have some dresses from the 1930s, and I have a whole bunch of those, those polyester novel t-shirts from like 1973, you know, the ones I mean with like the crazy bright patterns on the pointy collars. I bought those shirts, um, very specific association with those shirts. I bought them after I spent a weekend with a completely fabulous historian named Bethany Morton. She has written the definitive history of the religious underpinnings of the Walmart empire. And I met her at a history conference and I just loved her. She is brilliant and funny and like way more comfortable with human beings than I'll ever be and just completely fabulous. And I left the conference just basically wanting to be her. And I noticed that every day of the conference, she had kind of a uniform. It was like blue jeans and then one of these polyester novelty shirts. So I went, um, I went right back to North Carolina and I went to a secondhand store and I bought nine of them. <laughs> and when I wear them, I'm trying to be a little bit more like her, right? I'm hoping somehow these shirts will reshape me and make me a bit more Bethany-like. Then I have the clothes I actually wear most of the time, um, which are these sort of shapeless black dresses. Um, and these black dresses, I have also about nine of these. these. These shape me in the direction of the person that I probably am, actually the most, which is sort of the absent-minded professor who lives more in her head than in her body and doesn't really think about what she wears much, but just wakes up and throws on the shapeless black dress and usually a black or gray cardigan. This cardigan is really stepping out for me because it has a little color. And sometimes the cardigan is on inside out. Um, and then I hop on my tricycle and go tricycling off to my office at Duke, where recently one very brave student came up to politely tell me that not only the cardigan, but also the dress was on inside out. <laughs> so the shapeless black dress is the absent-minded professor uniform. And we all have this with clothing, right? That clothing shapes us somehow into a particular kind of identity. And this, it seems to me, must be at play in what Paul is doing when Paul says that we are clothed in Jesus. So how then are we being reshaped by our baptisms, by our Jesus clothing, not to be more like Bethany Morton and not to be more like the absent-minded professor, but to be more like him? That's, I think, part of this image. One more brief word about the clothing image. Um, again, clothing carries many associations. We could talk about how clothing carries memory and what does that mean. So why do you have your, the dress you wore on your first date hanging in your closet, although you're never going to wear it again? It carries memory in some particular way. What does that have to say about this image? How does clothing communicate 
something about our identities to the world, communicate something about our location and our commitments without, without our ever having to say anything. Clothing communicates something about us. But one more worry about clothing that I want to focus on for a minute um, is clothing's capacity to either create or interfere with community. So on the one hand, clothing can very much build up community, right? It, so this is why at Duke, where I teach on game day, everyone wears a Duke t-shirt, right? The clothing is helping mark people and stitch them into membership in this community of Dukies. Um, it's why my sister sometimes annoyingly dresses herself and her daughter in matching mother-daughter garb, right? She's using the clothing to help sustain their familial identity. So clothing can help build community. It can, of course, also do the opposite, right? Clothing can signal things about us to others such that we don't want to form community. Um, I teach once a week in a women's prison. And let me tell you that prison uniforms create a pretty stark barrier between the incarcerated people on a, in a prison and everyone else. They build a barrier between people, and that's part of what they're intended to do. So clothes can interfere with community, or clothes can actually break down those barriers. Right? School uniforms are a kind of clothing that their whole purpose is to occlude socioeconomic difference, etc., so that students might be able to bridge some differences and form friendship, form community, because barrier building clothing has been replaced by potentially community building clothing. I think this is very much at play in what Paul is talking about when he talks about Jesus as our clothing. Right after Paul tells us that we are clothed in Jesus, we get to that slightly more famous verse in Galatians where Paul says, you're clothed in Jesus, and in Jesus there is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male and female. And what's interesting about that verse is that the three things that are not in Jesus, those three pairs of differences, Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female, those are all differences that are at least partially created by clothing, right? So we know how clothing helps differentiate men and women. It's also true in most societies with slavery that there are certain kinds of clothing that enslaved people must wear and certain kinds of clothing that are reserved for free people. And the point of that is so that people can tell one another apart immediately. And the Jew-Gentile difference is noteworthy. In most Christian societies, for most of church history, the church has actually required Jews who live in Christian lands to wear clothing that marks them as Jewish. And they've said Christians are not going to wear that clothing. Only Jews will wear that clothing. So Paul seems to be saying certain kinds of differences are not supposed to exist in the body of Christ. And the differences that Christ overcomes are the differences that can be created through clothes. So Paul seems to be saying the kind of clothing that Jesus wants to be is like the school uniform that masks difference, not the kind of clothing that creates difference between people. So we have just about five minutes left before we go into some Q&A. And I use that five minutes to say one last word about clothing and then one other word. Um, clothing is also a very intimate image. To say that God is clothing 
is in a very literal way to say that God is and wants to be nestled up right next to you. Right? So when we think about how the Bible describes intimacy between us and God, we usually think about family language, that to name God as father can be language of great intimacy, or bridegroom, or friend. But this clothing language is actually language of intimacy in a much more literalistic way. And I actually think it's very powerful, I'm still trying to sit with this in prayer, to sit with the idea that God really wants to draw as close to me as these clothes are. And of course, when I think about my clothing, I have to acknowledge that my clothing is intimate with parts of myself that I think are beautiful and that I think are delightful, and my clothing is intimate with parts of myself that I wish were not there, right? Like, both. Clothing just nestles up to all of it. And that's a powerful thing to say about God, that God actually wants to draw near to us, drawing near to the beautiful and delightful parts of ourselves, and also drawing near to the parts of ourselves that we're ashamed of, or that we wish weren't there. God actually wants to draw near to all of that. I'm still trying to take that on board in my own prayer life. It may take me the rest of my life to do that. Um, I'll just conclude by saying uh, my aim in thinking about this larger topic of the metaphorical language the scriptures use for God, my aim is not to convert people to my, like, five favorite metaphors. I really love the clothing metaphor. Um, I really love the idea that comes from Hosea of God as a tree, but I don't need to convert others to my favorite metaphors. Um, Rather, I hope to sort of inspire our curiosity so that we can begin both going through the scriptures with this question, what's the stuff from my everyday life? that scripture uses to talk about God, but also so that we can begin going through our daily lives noticing that if the scriptures tell you that God is like clothing or the scriptures tell you that God is like a tree, then trees and clothing get a whole lot more interesting because then when we look at them, when we walk into our backyard or we open our closet, we're not just seeing trees and clothing, we're seeing objects that hold little clues about who God is. And I'll um, I'll conclude with just one illustration of that. I just finished teaching a course this past semester at the women's prison in Raleigh, which I've already mentioned, that prison, And I was teaching a class where half of the students were incarcerated and half of the students came over from Duke with me to the class. And it was a class on this topic of metaphorical language in the Bible for God. And at the end of the semester, one of the non-incarcerated students told me that she walks her dogs every day in a graveyard near her apartment. And one day there were three grave diggers digging a new grave in this graveyard. And she struck up a conversation with them and they talked for like a good half an hour about like, how did they come to be grave diggers? What is it like to be a grave digger? Who are they? Where do they live in town? Etc. And she said she went home thinking about a verse from Deuteronomy, a verse that I have to admit I had never noticed before in the Bible, The verse from Deuteronomy um, where Moses dies and then Deuteronomy tells us that God buried Moses on a hill in Moab. So I had never noticed that. I hadn't told my student to think about God as a grave digger. But now she did. Like, she was taking her daily dog walk and chatting with the grave diggers 
at her daily cemetery dog walking site. And somehow that experience held for her, surprisingly, some information about God. Because the scriptures, in fact, do tell us that once upon a time, for at least one day, God was a grave digger and dug a grave and buried the person that most of the rabbis would identify as his best friend. That if God has a best friend, it's Moses. And Deuteronomy gives us a picture of God making a grave for him and burying him. And you can learn about that while walking your dog. So, what I love about this larger inquiry is that I think it does make going through a day on the planet a whole lot more interesting if, like, the dog walk can become an opportunity for learning about the Lord. And also because it means that we all actually know more about how to read the Bible than we think we know. Like, I'm not a Bible expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I actually know a whole lot about some of the things that are going on in the Bible, because I know a lot about clothing and trees and the bible uses those things to tell me who god is so i'm going to stop tim is going to come say some things have i got the choreography right tim Mm -hmm. then we're going to have some q a at these microphones do you need my mic because you don't have any batteries i I think i got a couple batteries so we're good will you thank lauren This is the first clapping. Okay. Yeah. We're just going through the process again. Okay, so yes, I'm going to let Lauren rest her voice for a second. Um, this is the final event, I mentioned that, in this year's season. Uh, it also happens, therefore, this is the end of the 14th season, so Lauren's actually our 70th speaker in this series, which I find hard to believe. Um, but always at these events, I mention what the next event will be, and that one... Uh, won't be until the fall, but it's indicated in your program tonight on the inside right page at the bottom. And it will be, mark your calendars, Thursday, September 28th, 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and it'll feature former Minnesota Vikings linebacker Chad Greenway. Uh, nice. Yeah. And actually, he's all, that, in, in the 14 years of this series, he is only the second professional athlete we've ever hosted. The other one was Hillary Lunky, who is a golfer who uh, won the U.S. Women's Open a number of years ago from Edina. So I hope you'll join us for that. If you would like us to remind you of that electronically, you should have an insert in your um, programs. I didn't grab one, uh, but you're welcome to leave that insert in one of the baskets in the narthex with your email. Uh, we'll add your email to our distribution list. You can also go to the Faith and Life website and enter your email there or go to um, our Facebook page and we try to keep people updated about our events that way. I will also mention we're hard at work building a new website. Um, our current one's very nice, but the new one will be even cooler. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll announce the whole season for next year, um, late July, early to mid-August. So uh, look for that. And the whole season has actually been scheduled, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll save the other four for a little more of a surprise later in the summer. So again, September 28th, 7 o'clock uh, here in the sanctuary. Um, and I always do take a few moments, especially at the end of the season, to say a few thank yous from the start of these uh, events. They have always been funded entirely through the generosity of individuals and area organizations. Um, they are not part of the church's budget, and we couldn't do them without the generosity of some amazing people. Um, they are listed uh, on the third page of your program. I'm not going to name all of them. Um, but you can read about them. But I will uh, mention at least our corporate sponsors, Mastercraft Labels, uh, Productivity Inc., Rapid Packaging, Thrivent Financial uh, Community Crossroads Group, Cressa, uh, Honeybee Capital, uh, Motive Action, another area company, Sparky, uh, Anselm House, which is a a Christian study center at the University of Minnesota, Um, Fuzzy Duck, um, Luther Seminary, uh, Mount Oliver, Plymouth, I've already mentioned, and St. Philip. uh, Again, we don't contribute to it financially, but we run it. Um, And then you see all of the other amazing individuals who help to make these events possible and allow us 
to bring wonderful speakers uh, like Lauren Winter. Uh, many of those individuals are here tonight. Will you please join me in saying thank you? I also uh, want to give a shout out to Jeff. Where are you, Jeff? Are you there? Oh yeah, Jeff Elstad. Uh, you heard his beautiful music when you came in. Jeff has been, um, with a couple of exceptions to every single one of these events from the very beginning, and we're delighted that we're able to enjoy his music before and after. So Jeff, thank you very much for your music. Okay. Um, we're going to take a few minutes for questions. Again, we've got a mic here and a mic over there. Uh, if you do have a question, I would prefer you come forward so everyone can hear what it is. And um, we'll, we'll take questions for, again, 10 or 15 minutes. I'm, <clears throat> I'm delighted to see you in person. Having read some of what you have written and admired your witty and specific way of writing about the spiritual life. Thank you. You would like to write for all Christians, I presume. At the same time, uh, I wonder if you know who are the people who most love you and <laughs> respond to you. That is to say... Are they mostly evangelicals? Are they mostly historic denomination people? Are they mostly Catholics or Orthodox? They're and probably are they, not mostly Orthodox. <laughs> or are they uh, young? Or are they old? Are they city or rural people? Do you have any sense of the demographics of the people who love you? So I really don't. Um, and I probably could have more of a sense of demographics of people who read me if I sought it, but I think it would make me totally neurotic, honestly. <laughs> I think it would make me crazier than I am <laughs> on a normal daily basis. So, <clears throat> probably in a way that is not helpful for my so-called career, I really try, in a certain way, I really try not to think, of, well... I'm about to say something that my, even what I did this afternoon contradicts. I was about to say, I really try not to think about like, these specific questions of who the demographic of the audience is and to sort of trust that if someone needs the book, the book will find them. Um, but that's not completely true. And I actually think it, it is, it's actually this experience of pastoring in this particular church where I've been for four years has, whether or not it is an accurate reflection of who else in the wider world is reading me, I think because, frankly, most of what I write now, or half of what I write now are sermons for a particular congregation. And it's a congregation of late middle age and older small town Episcopalians. And so I think that that um, has has probably, is probably shaping my writing in some particular directions. Um, and I do think about, I think, I'm just thinking through every book I've written, I do think every book I've written I've had in mind, like usually actually a specific person that in some way I'm writing for, mm -hmm. like an actual individual mm -hmm. human being. Um, so I think that's, in a way, who I'm writing for. But of course, also, I'm writing to figure out this stuff for myself. I mean, I don't know what I think about anything until I've written seven drafts of something about it. Um, so today I was working on, I was doing some grading, and then I'm finishing up a very short book, like short, 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 on basically like, what should Episcopalians know about the Bible when they sit down to read it, as for a series that the Episcopal Church is publishing. And I thought I was just going to, like, knock this out. I thought, how hard can it be? And I was just sort of doing it because I was asked to. It wasn't something that I felt a burning curiosity about. But in writing it, I wrote my way into all kinds of questions I didn't know the answers to. And, like, for example... 
why do we read so much scripture in worship? Like, I had actually never thought about that, but when I stopped to think about it, it seemed a little weird. Like, why are we reading the scriptures back to God? Or it just seemed peculiar. So, in a way, I sort of made myself the audience of this book because I wrote my way into stuff I didn't understand, and then I got obsessively interested in it. And so I can't really answer your question. <laughs> but thanks for asking. Next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jenny, and I've enjoyed your writings and your perspectives since, like, mid-2000s from college. But I have one kind of quick question that maybe is a short answer, and then one that might be one that we could be here Step a little bit into the sure. mic. Sure. Okay. First question is, what's the strangest metaphor as you've been exploring this? Interesting. And the second question is, you mentioned a little bit about the gender dynamics in one of your uh, comments, and I was wondering... You know, I've talked to men that are like, well, I don't know what it feels like to be a bride, you know, so the imagery of being the bride of Christ or something, but how does metaphor help us explore more of the spectrum of gender given the gender dynamics within yeah, that language? Yeah, those are both good questions. So I'm actually going to answer them with the same answer. I'm not sure that this is really the strangest metaphor, but certainly one of the metaphors that has made me the most uncomfortable. Where did you go? Uh, <laughs> that made me the most uncomfortable and still does um, is the metaphor that comes from Isaiah of God as a woman in labor. So this is not like a generic God as a mother image. It is one lone verse in Isaiah where God in the first person says, I, I am a woman in labor who has kept silent. So this is God talking about bringing about new birth for Israel who is in exile in Babylon. And in this section of Isaiah, God is saying, you're in exile. It totally looks like I've abandoned you. I have not abandoned you. I've got this, God is saying. And God uses all kinds of metaphors. There's some military metaphors, but then there's this one verse where God says, I am a woman in labor. And then there, in this one verse, there are three different verbs different verbs in the Hebrew that all mean different versions of bellowing and grunting. Like, but now I will cry out and bellow and grunt with the effort of bringing you out of exile. Uh, I don't, I mean, is this, this is probably the strangest metaphor, but it is a metaphor that makes me uncomfortable. And it makes me uncomfortable because who wants a God who's in bodily pain? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> like, I prefer a God who's sovereign up in the skies and like waving a magic wand, sort of, I think. And it's just, it's such a graphic image of God like suffering and struggling to heal us. So, of course, if I don't want a God who has bodily anguish for our sake, I'm really in the wrong religion because there is the whole crucifixion moment, right? So this is a metaphor that actually I think has helped me like get more in touch with the reality of the crucifixion because I finally realized if this one little verse in Isaiah is making me this uncomfortable, why am I not uncomfortable when I come to the long chunks of the Gospels that describe God in bodily anguish for the sake of our new birth, <laughs> you know? Um, and then this gets to the gender thing. Um, so what I, one of the things one of the reasons I like being interested in the laboring mother image um, is that I don't, have, I don't have children. I have not been a laboring woman. This is not like a female image. Like my, my relationship with this image tells me that you do not have to have experienced the thing in question to have some connection. Now, because I got interested in this image, I did try to learn more about labor. I talked to friends of mine who have had children. I've done some reading about labor. But it really, for me, um, br broke down the idea that the images we 
connect to will be those of which we ha will only be those of which we've had direct experience. So I think that that would just apply across the board with the metaphors that are particularly gendered or that seem particularly gendered. And another thing I just would suggest is that <clears throat> when one starts to learn more about some of these metaphors, one thing that I at least have learned is that certain images excuse me, that I think of as masculine images or male images aren't actually as obviously masculine as I thought they were. And an example of this actually is the shepherd image. So as I started doing some research on shepherds to try to actually, um, I mean, basically I started doing this research because I was going to be preaching on one of the shepherd passages and I didn't want to give that sermon that we've all heard a million times about how, like, if God is a shepherd, then we are sheep, and sheep are actually stupid, and it's not a good thing to be a sheep. I didn't want to give that sermon. So I thought I needed to learn some more things about sheep and shepherding. So one thing that I learned is that in many parts of the world, many, many parts of the world, shepherding is a job given to young girls. And then once I learned that, I realized that actually there are some girl shepherds in the Bible itself, right? So Moses has that encounter with some women, one of whom he eventually marries. They have taken their father's flock and they're taking them to give them water. And some male shepherds come and chase them out, try to chase them out of the watering hole and Moses stands up for them. I think this is actually like the biblical depiction of workplace sexual harassment. Um, and also Rachel is depicted as working as a shepherd in Genesis. So I always think of like David and boy Jesus shepherd stained glass. But actually, to call God a shepherd may also be to identify God with work done around the world by young girls that's pretty vulnerable work when you're a young girl doing it, because some boy shepherds might come and try and chase you away. So I think there is often more complicated gender stuff going on underneath the surface. I'll just say one more cool example of that, and then I will take these other two questions. Um, for Holy Thursday at my church, we have a foot washing. So I was doing some research on foot washing. So there are several rabbinic texts that say that foot washing is the job of a wife to do for her husband. And even if you're a wealthy according to these rabbinic texts, written, you know, not too, too long after the life of Jesus. Uh, even if you're wealthy, you can't have your servants do the foot washing. You are supposed to wash your husband's feet. So I thought that was pretty cool to think about that in terms of Jesus washing our feet. So again, it just sort of destabilizes what we think we know about where is the masculine and where is the feminine in these stories. Okay, two more questions. I'm wondering if you could tell us just briefly what was the reaction of your friends and family to your conversion from the Jewish faith to Christianity? Yes, I can tell you briefly. Um, it, was not, it was not full of enthusiasm. <laughs> That's the brief answer. Um, the slightly less brief answer is that my conversion was pretty painful, I think, for members of, particularly members, and friends, some friends and family, um, and I think it was painful partially because um, Christianity has done so much violence to Jews over the centuries in the name of Jesus. So I think it would have been less painful if I had like converted to Buddhism. There's no long history of Buddhists murdering Jews and burning down their buildings in the name of the Buddha, right? So there's a, I think there's a particular pain and sense of betrayal associated with the conversion from Judaism to Christianity. 
And I also think there's some pain there because, of course, from one perspective, the whole story of Christianity is the story of Christians interpreting Judaism differently than Jews do and saying, we actually know what this story means and we see things that you don't see. So I think there's just, I think it's a particularly painful axis of conversion. Um, that said, my father in particular has really astounded me. I mean, he was, he was really quite upset about my conversion. And I was 21. So for a good, a good couple of years, he very reasonably thought maybe it was a phase and I was going to get over it because people do things when they're 21 that are phases that they get over. Uh, so that didn't turn out to be the case. But what's, what is remarkable to me about my father is that um, though my conversion has been, and I think continues 20 years later to be painful for him, he has read every single one of my books, um, which are all about Christianity, I, and he's proud of me. And I think he would be, it would be easier for him to be proud of me if I'd written, you know, marginally successful books about gardening or something. Um, and uh, he's, I mean, I, I think it's, I feel that it's remarkable that he does that, actually. So it has not been easy, um, but I think we've all gotten used to each other, as, as one does over and over and over again in one's life with one's extended family. Um, so, but I feel really... You know, when I was 21, I didn't really appreciate why exactly it would be hard for him, and I kind of, in that annoyed 21-year-old way, felt like, oh, just get over yourself, you know? Um, but now I feel that I can see more about the difficulty and the generosity that he has showed me. We'll take one more formal question, and then I'm going to be here until we close the place down. So I'm very happy to hang out in some other room in the North X with other questions. Well, I was just going to pull you to the side, but uh, your earrings are part of your clothing because your earrings sparkle all the way, <laughs> like a twinkle in the stars. And you can see all the way back there. Cool. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Since that was not actually a question, we'll take one more. I and my sparkle. Um, I hear faint echoes of uh, Barbara Brown Taylor and a lot of the things you've been saying. And I'm going to ask you as an author, who are the authors you are reading? Who are the authors I'm reading? Well, I'm always reading Barbara Brown Taylor, um, and I'm honored to think that I'm echoing her. Um, so right now I'm reading, it's not, it's not a Christian book. In fact, it is really not a Christian book. Uh, that book, Sapiens, that came out a couple of years ago. Has anyone read this? Sapiens by, what's the guy's name? Yuval Harari, I think. He's an Israeli historian, and it like, became a super famous book because both Bill Gates and Barack Obama loved it. And it is a history of the world. <laughs> he teaches, I think, at Tel Aviv University, and he got stuck teaching this history class that no one else wanted to teach, which was the history of everything class. And he taught it and has, has written this book that I'm now reading that is a history of Homo sapiens from the beginning I've gotten, I've gotten right up to the split of Homo sapiens and other uh, human species, so I'm not very far along. Um, but he has, he's clearly going to make an argument throughout the whole book that what Homo sapiens have that the rest of creatures don't have is the ability to imagine fiction. And that, you, and that it is the ability to imagine fiction that has allowed us to organize complex societies. He says you can organize a society of about 100 based on gossip. Gossip will let you regulate a society of about 100 people. Beyond that, or 100 uh, uh, orangutans, um, beyond that, you need the ability to generate enthusiasm and common cause among people who don't know each other because they all imagine the same fiction. And for him, Christianity is one of the fictions that has organized much of human society. So I'm obviously not 
in complete agreement with this account, but it's, it's a really intriguing account. Um, I am also reading a bunch of mid 20th century fiction by British women. I've gotten on this kick of novels written during the Second World War, around the Second World War, by British women. Um, and in about 20 minutes, I'll think of some more things that I'm reading. And if you are still here, I will tell you then. Okay. And now, and now. you did that very well. Thank, don't clap yet. Um, <laughs> We always give our speakers uh, a little parting gift. It's a little piece of granite with the Faith and Life logo, and it says, in your case, uh, with thanks to Lauren Winner cool. for bringing faith to life. Thanks. We do thank you very, very much. Thank you.